You're listening to the Holistic Nootropics Podcast, your home for holistic, evidence-based cognitive enhancement strategies. And now your host, Eric Levi. Hey, what is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Holistic Nootropics Podcast. My name is Eric. I'm a nutritional therapy practitioner. And on this podcast, we discuss using nootropics, biohacking, and nutrition to help you boost your cognition. Today on the podcast, I have Dr. Peter Kozlowski. Peter, Dr. Koz is a functional medicine doctor out of Chicago, Illinois, now residing in Montana. He has a new book out available on Amazon and wherever books are sold called Unfunk Your Gut. Dr. Koz, welcome to the Holistic Nootropics Podcast. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. Like I was telling you off air, I am so excited to talk with you. I've been reading your book. Uh, I think it's really uh, a fun read. It's an interesting read. I think it's a, a real easy concept to break down for people who probably need it the most, who don't get into these, you know, big um, health concepts. I know, especially when you start talking about the gut, things can get a little confusing. There's a lot of different, you know, variables, and the fact that we still are learning so much about the gut every single day. Um, so. Before we talk about the book, uh, I'd love to know your story in medicine. What brought you to functional medicine? And then ultimately, what led you to writing this book? Yeah, yeah. It's a, I got into functional medicine um, just by luck, by random luck. And the majority of people get into medicine uh, or into functional medicine because they were practitioners themselves. They got sick and then they used the traditional approach and they couldn't get better. My story was, is, is a little bit different. Um, my own story of illness is that I'm personally in recovery from alcoholism. Um, so when I started, my parents are immigrants from Poland. So I was born in the United States. My parents are both doctors in Poland. I grew up wanting to be a doctor. Um, and then I got into college and I chose the kind of the party lifestyle over studying. Uh, I went to Arizona State University. I was in pre-med, but pre-med, the, the class, my chemistry class was Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 840 in the morning. And Thursday night was our big night of going out. So I never made it to class on Friday mornings. All my friends were in business school. Business school was closed on Fridays. So I made the switch to economics and psychology. Um, during my senior year of uh, college, my best friend came back from spring break um, with a rash and started getting sick and couldn't explain what was going on. Um, after about a month, she was diagnosed with lupus and then she passed away a week after uh, we graduated. And so that kind of changed my life and made me think to, to want to be a doctor because I was there for her, but I couldn't help her at all. Um, now having learned medicine, like she had an extremely severe case of lupus. You, you, I've never heard of that again, someone being diagnosed and passing away in a few months. Um, so that led me to get back into, to take classes, to take my MCATs, to go to med school, get into residency. During that whole time, I really enjoyed to go out and um, let loose after studying for intense periods. Um, I tried to give up alcohol when I was an intern in residency. I couldn't. I was sent to treatment um, for six weeks. So I went to like an inpatient treatment. Um, I walked in there and I never thought I had an issue. I mean, I was just kind of like a binge drinker. I wasn't a daily drinker. It was, I was just, did not think I needed to be there. Once I was there, the, the six week program had nothing to do with alcohol and it all had to do with like my mental health and what was I lacking inside that made me want to drink to, to mask that. So, and they used modalities like yoga, meditation, acupuncture, uh, the focus on exercise and all these things that nobody had ever talked to me about during med school or residency, right? It was basically just learning about what drug to give to what condition. So I came out of there and I went back to residency and just with different person, obviously. Um, and we, I'd say more than anything, just an open mind, because I went in there thinking I was perfect. I had the world figured out and I was extremely humbled and learned that there's other things out there and I'm, maybe I wasn't perfect. 
So as a family medicine resident, you do different rotations. One month you focus on inpatient medicine, outpatient medicine, OB, GYN, surgery. So you do all these different, you're learning all these different skills and you have different attendings that teach you and different attendings have different styles, right? And we had this one doctor named Dr. Batra that every person that was hospitalized, he would put them on a multivitamin and vitamin D. And we would always make fun of him. We're like, why are you doing that? Like, it's a waste of our time. He was the only one doing it. So we kind of picked on him. He, I was on call with him on a Sunday night. It was like two in the morning. And I kind of just asked him, I was like, Dr. Batra, why are you weird? You know, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm studying this thing called functional medicine. And I was like, what's that? And it's all about getting at the root cause of disease. So it, he showed me the website. As a resident, they require and pay for you to go do continuing medical education. So go to conferences. So I went to AFMCP, the kind of week-long general conference. And within the first hour, I knew that I could never look at medicine the same. It was all taught from like the biochemistry, physiology level. Like it just made sense. I couldn't argue with it. Um, and the, the most shocking thing at that conference is, is that I, I was, I think I was the youngest one there at the time um, or the earliest in their career. And everybody, I was meeting doctors that were like well-established into surgery careers or an ENT or a, a neurologist and a, an OB. And I'm like, I just didn't understand what was going on. Like, why are you guys here? Um, and everybody was telling me like, this is the future. This is the future. Um, this is, if you're just starting your career, this is what you should focus on. Um, so I, I kind of just took a risk. I was like, I, I don't know. I mean, these people seem like they know what they're talking about. This stuff makes sense to me. I'm going to try it. And my family and my friends all think I thought I was nuts. I think some of them still do. Um, but it, that I, I met another thing that happened at that conference is I met a lot of doctors there that were kind of leaders in the field. And I got invited to do away rotations. Um, as a resident, if your program approves you, you can go leave your program for a month at a time and, and go study somewhere else in something that you're interested in. So I, I went to Dr. Hyman's clinic. I went to Dr. Susan Blum's clinic. I went to Dr. Deepak Chopra's clinic. And I just had huge notepads and I would just follow everybody around and just notes, questions, notes, questions. And it wasn't just the doctors, it was the nurses, it was the health coach, the life coach, the receptionist, like everybody was teaching me something. Um, and I finished residency and I started a functional medicine practice. Um, so that's the quick slash long version of, of how I got to functional medicine. Well, it, I appreciate you going through all that because it's so important for people to hear the story of doctors like yourself essentially turning their back on what we call, you know, traditional allopathic medicine and embracing functional medicine, which a lot of regular mainstream doctors have a huge problem with for some reason. Uh, I mean, there I, I, I know the reason, but uh, there's like websites and doctors that just always come out slandering and, you know, putting down these functional medicine doctors. And what they don't realize is that it's actually the functional medicine doctors, patients who are getting better. And what the other thing they don't realize is that when they get better, the doctor doesn't make more money off that patient. So what is the incentive? It's the worst to, business model. It's the worst business medicine. model, especially when you start to teach people about vitamins and minerals and movement and all these holistic practices and all these, you know, uh, evidence-based holistic practices. Right. And they start to use it and they start to use, they get vitamin D in their life. They get magnesium in their life. They start getting sunshine. They start embracing better relationships and you go and they go, wow, this actually worked better for my mood than that SSRI I was on for five years. And yeah. then they stop taking the SSRI and the doctor sees them less. And what does the doctor do? He doesn't have a patient anymore. Well, he finds another patient to help. And the doctors that are, you know, again, the mainstream allopathic medicine doctors, they have a, they, they, they have a huge problem with this. And, uh, and every time I talk to a functional medicine doctor, I, it's always a very similar thread where it comes out of, 
you were the one that was suffering at first. You experienced the need for medical treatment. And so the me search turns into research, which turns into the practice of helping others. I a hundred percent agree. Um, I mean, you, I don't think you could have said it better. Um, I, you know, when patients start with me, I warn them like, Hey, we might be doing a lot in the next six months or in the next year. But if you get this done now, you won't need to spend $58,000 a year on Biogen's newest Alzheimer drug, right? Mm -hmm. down the road. Um, so you're going to have a little bit more upfront in the beginning, but the way I know my patients are doing well is I don't hear from them. And I've had a number of people that have reached out over the uh, last two months since I put, put out my book that were like, Oh, I saw your book. Want to let you know I'm doing great. Like, and this is people from five, six years ago. And, but obviously that was not good for my business, but it, I mean, that's the, the goal, right? I mean, I, I don't, I've always tried to practice honesty in my practice, being straightforward. I don't like to sell things or et cetera. It's basically like, let's figure out what's going on, fix it and move on and like, enjoy your life and forget about me. Yeah. That's, that's so important for, again, for people to hear and to know that, look, there's a doctor because I think people believe that doctors have their best interests and you should, that's like what a doctor is, but somewhere along the way, it, the doctor also became like a nanny in a way where it was like, every time I'm sick, I have to go to the doctor and I need to hear from them to tell me what I probably already know, but I don't want to like face that myself. Um, functional medicine, holistic nutrition, uh, holistic medicine seems to be more like, I'm going to break this down for you to the cellular level so we can start rebuilding you back up um, and try some things maybe you don't know, you know, uh, like, okay, for instance, like your, uh, you know, people who are alcoholics, right, have a severe uh, vitamin B1, uh, vitamin B1 deficiency. And, you know, they, the doctor doesn't, they don't want to hear from their doctor to quit drinking, but a functional medicine doctor can not only tell them why they need to quit drinking, but actually tell them physiologically the benefits like, Hey, do you wake up and you just feel lethargic? Are you having pains in certain parts of your stomach? Are you uh, also having mood disorders? Well, it could all be uh, attested to the drinking. And then I also have a supplement that I can put on top of that to help replenish these depleted stores that you might be missing. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, 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 um, for specifically like alcohol, one of the biggest things that I had to go through was when you give up alcohol, I used to never eat sweets. And then I gave up alcohol and, and my body was having sugar cravings every night. And it was um, not, a, maybe not every night, but um, a lot of, you'll hear that a lot in treatment centers is people that like get off of something and they're like, man, I really like love ice cream now or love, um, but it's your chemistry changing. Um, and your, your body's, you know, used to a, a certain amount of sugar a few times a week. And then all of a sudden you don't have it. You, you need to kind of go through the withdrawals and, 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 and change. Absolutely. So your, your book unfunk your gut, um, I haven't read the whole thing. I've, uh, I basically, uh, probably about a third of the way through it. And I'm interested to know how you became so like, like what in, in your experience, I don't know if it was a doctor or personal experience brought the gut to like the center of your, of your consciousness. So it, from the first day of functional medicine training, I just think it was ingrained in me over and over again. Start with the gut, start with the gut. If you don't know where to start, start with the gut. And then there's the quote from Hippocrates that he said 3000 years ago, all disease begins in the gut. And so he knew this that long ago without any of the testing, without any of the knowledge we have. And to me, the funniest thing about it is that since he said that everything we've done is pretty damaging to the gut antibiotics, meds, stress, our, the toxins in our environment, our food supply. So he figured this out. And then we've basically turned that around and, and, and completely destroyed our guts. So when I started my practice, I mean, the honest truth is, is definitely it was trial and error. Um, you know, you, you go through family medicine residency, you go through the functional medicine training, and then you can join someone who's going to kind of guide you. And for me, I just went off on my own and I just 
used my knowledge and then had some colleagues that I would ask questions. But I, uh, the, the other big thing that I always um, like to say is that I learned a ton from my patients in the beginning. I was coming from a very traditional standpoint. Like I knew a lot about meds and surgeries and all this stuff. But when people started introducing me supplements and, and like, hey, I'm doing this or that, I always kept an open mind. I was like, okay, like I'm gonna put that in the back of my thought process. If I meet somebody that's going through this and this person told me that they were doing this. So I learned a lot from my patients. Um, then getting comfortable with the lab testing. So functional medicine to me, I do use a lot of lab testing. So I do like to be very objective. So when we're looking at the gut stool testing, urine testing, the organic acid test, um, and then SIBO breath testing and learning those tests and, and getting those results and then trying treatments. I mean, it's like the treatments are evidence-based and it, it's the similar model, but it's also every person. I mean, the, the core of functional medicine is every person is different, right? So I, I've always tried to stay out of like protocols and like here, everybody should do this or everybody should do that. It, 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 we try a certain thing, but then every patient will respond differently. So you kind of need to update what you're doing um, based on the individual. Um, and I, I mean, I guess I just uh, like a lot of things in my life, I just didn't give up. And, and me, I mean, one of my biggest faults or good things is I'm a perfectionist, like, and, and I only focused on people that weren't getting better. Right. So if people were getting better. They, I don't even, I don't remember them a lot of the time. People that are not are the ones that I, you know, I'm doing the research. I'm like, what else can I try? What could this be? Um, and then I went into more conferences outside of IFM. So I really focused on environmental medicine because um, I was finding that that's probably the second biggest thing I do behind gut health is detox. Um, and then I grew up, I said, my parents were doc or doctors. My mom's a pediatrician. I always liked pediatrics. Um, so I did a lot of training with the MAPS Medical Academy of Pediatric Special Needs, which is mostly a focus on autism. So I've worked a lot with autistic children. Um, and so just continuing to kind of explore um, different parts of, of functional medicine, hormones, um, and just learning more and more and then learning from my patients. One thing that's really popped up for me since I've been doing this podcast and talking to a lot of, um, you know, functional practitioners like yourself, it just was like a huge just aha moment for me, like just siren, just screaming in my head is uh, antibiotics and just the amount of antibiotics used at, to the point where the CDC has come out and said, stop giving antibiotics. Like, I, I forget the percentage, I have it written down somewhere, but it's like, I don't know, like 70 or 80% are just completely inappropriate and doctors pass them out like candy. And not only do you have this issue of antibiotic resistance, I think that's incredibly important, but I think you also have this other huge problem where these antibiotics and we're giving them to kids like three, four or five years old. I mean, you're just completely changing the biochemistry of somebody's gut, which like you said, like hypocrisy said, like this is where disease begins. This is where all the problems start. This is where health starts. Um, and the fact that we just so cavalierly just give these things out for every problem. I had COVID um, a month ago and the doctor gave me a prescription for azithromycin. Uh, and I was like, why are you giving me a prescription for this? He goes, you know, I don't know. Some people say that it's good. And I'm like, dude, what the, are you serious? It's an antibiotic and I have a virus. I mean, I'm no trained professional. Even I know that's nonsense. And it's almost like they just use it because they're like, how can I make this person shut up, put this in your mouth, suck it down. And I won't see you again for six weeks until you come back with another problem, which will probably be SIBO or, you know, who knows? Exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they, I mean, the way I always describe it, right? We focus on your microbiome, which is the three to five pounds of bacteria that live on the inside of your large intestine. The majority of antibiotics, where do we put them? In a tube that has five pounds of bacteria in it, right? So taking antibiotics just one time ever can wipe out a third to a half of your good bacteria. And going further on the microbiome, my favorite analogy is thinking of it as your own garden, 
right? And in that analogy, probiotics are the plants of your garden. So that's the lactobacillus, bifidobacterium, enterococcus, the good bacteria. The, what happens in your garden at home when you don't take care of it is weeds grow, right? If you spray it with a bunch of glyphosate, it's, most of it's going to die. Well, taking an antibiotic is basically like spraying your garden with a bunch of glyphosate or some other kind of um, weed killer. And then we're being exposed to viruses, parasites, bacteria all the time. And then let's say you're not making enough stomach acid. Your body doesn't shut down those bacteria. They're passing through your large intestine and they see all this fertile soil and they're like, oh, wow, let's set up shop here. And then they take over. And the, the bad part is, is most people don't get like symptoms from dysbiosis, right? It'll present down the road as eczema or um, as rheumatoid arthritis or as headaches or, or you know, you, you don't know until it's too late, um, which is one of my hopes is that at some point, like a stool test becomes part of like a yearly well check right? That we look at your micro, instead of doing like a CBC and a CMP, like let's do a stool analysis. Cause a lot of times when I do one people, you know, we get back dysbiosis, SIBO, whatever. And people are like, well, when did this happen? I'm like, well, you know, you were born premature. You, you spent two weeks in the NICU where every baby's getting loaded with antibiotics. It mm-hmm. could have started then you were two, you were getting ear infections all the time you were getting antibiotics a few times a year could have been then. And we don't, I have no, I'm like, my answer is I have no clue. This could have started a month ago. This could have started 30 years ago. If we started doing more, you know, if people had that more of a baseline, we'd have a better idea of like, Hey, when did things go wrong? Right. And that, and, and that's the thing is people are always thinking like, Oh, it must be something I did like the other day, but, it's interesting because in your book, um, you mention like uh, IgG and IgE responses, right? You mentioned the difference between those two tests. And I think that's a thing that, you know, people are trying to be more sophisticated. And the doctor says, we can do a food sensitivity test. And the person goes, yeah, that's great. I'll find out what I'm sensitive to. And they don't realize that there's so many of the wrong kind of tests coming back. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that, like how these food sensitivity, like, first of all, the difference between a food sensitivity and a food allergy, and then the difference between IgG, IgE, and why and why trying to tie a specific sensitivity to a thing you just ate might not be the accurate way to assess that. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to. This is definitely one area in my field where I differ because there's a lot of practitioners in my field that do order a lot of IgG food panels. Even kind of the the people that I trained from did it. What I learned about, I've never ordered one in my career. So that that's, I guess that's how I feel about IgG food uh, sensitivity testing. When your body reacts to food, there's three main reactions. So you mentioned IgE, which is an allergy. IgA, which is celiac disease, so it's specific to gluten, or IgG, which is sensitivity. There's main differences. And I always say that allergies and celiac are easy to work with because the the, the biggest reason why is because the reaction happens almost right after you eat the food. So you don't make it into your 20s or 60s and not know that you're allergic to peanuts. The other thing is if you're not sure, you can go to your doctor and there's reliable blood testing, skin testing, and you can diagnose what somebody's allergic to. You do a blood draw and you get a reliable result. IgG antibodies, food sensitivities are what I work with and what we work with in functional medicine. And what makes them so difficult is that the reaction is delayed hours to days after eating the food. So the example that I always use is like, I can eat a bagel every day for breakfast and I feel fine. I feel great, but I have chronic migraines. I got depression. My skin's starting to get a rash. My knees are hurting. And I go to my doctor and I get a pill for the headaches. I get a pill for my knee. I get a pill for my gut. I get a pill for the depression. And I keep eating the bagel every day. I'm never going to get better. I'm going to just end up on more and more pills and I'm going to be a great customer, right? They're going to make a lot of money on me over time and I'll think that I'm doing the right stuff. So, and you'll never know, like without 
And so the, the way, the only way, in my opinion, to really diagnose food sensitivities is uh, with a 21 elimination, 21 day elimination diet with reintroduction. And so there's a lot of variations. People have said like, yeah, I've done elimination diet, the whole 30, whatever. The elimination diet is based on science. So everything in your body has a half-life, right? So if you drink alcohol, if you smoke weed, if you take prescription meds, your hormones, lead, mercury, mold, toxins, everything has a different half-life. The half-life of IgG antibodies is about 21 days. So let's say I had that bagel for breakfast this morning and I have 100 IgG antibodies floating around. If I avoid gluten for 21 days, that antibody count will drop in half to 50. So the immune response is cut in half. On day 22, I eat the gluten again. If my body remembers it, my immune system remembers it, it'll attack. Mm -hmm. And that, and that, this is probably the kind of gets me to the, the most important thing about the gut. The inside of your gut is actually considered outside of your body. So the gut is a tube that runs from the mouth to the anus. There's openings on both ends. If you swallow something and poop it out, it's never been in your body. So the, to me, besides digestion and absorption, the most important role is for your gut to decide like, hey, this should come in, this should stay out. And that's that term leaky gut. Mm. So when gluten proteins get into the bloodstream through the gut barrier, now it's in the bloodstream, which is now in your body. Where does the bloodstream go? Everywhere, right? From your head to your toes. The blood's going everywhere. It's carrying oxygen. If that's why you could take 100 people with a dairy sensitivity or SIBO or dysbiosis or a gluten sensitivity, and everybody has different symptoms. And that is why the gut is the gateway in, like, for disease, health, and it's the gateway into your body. And so when you eat gluten again on day 22, let's say you went into it because of migraines. When you in, your migraines are gone, when you reintroduce gluten, you might get a rash. You could get abdominal symptoms. You might not get the symptoms that you're looking for. That doesn't mean that it's not inflaming your body, which at different times can present differently. So in my experience, an IgG food test is typically just the best test for leaky gut. The majority of people you ask that have done that testing, it's basically a log of what you've been eating for the last two to three months. And because if you have leaky gut, the gap junctions are open. And then those foods that you're eating frequently are getting into your blood and your immune system can have this low level response to them. And that shows up on a test. So the, the way that I, I've always said that I, I would use a food sensitivity test. If I had a patient who was really resistant to an elimination diet, they're like, they won't do it. That either hasn't happened or they haven't come back to me. Um, so I, I've never ordered one, but I've put thousands of people on an elimination diet. And I think you mentioned in the book too, that the, the biggest problem with those food sensitivity tests is they tell you a thing you're sensitive to, but that actually could be more of a reading representing what you've actually eaten versus exactly. what you're sensitive to. And exactly. so like I did one of those one time and I immediately like my spidey sense went off and was like, something's not right here because it basically told me I'm sensitive to all the things I'm eating anyways. So like, uh, I don't know how to make out with this information. I, I would then look at addressing leaky gut, right? right? If that, if that's the way someone's test came back, I'd be like, okay, there's something that's making your gap junctions and your gut lining open. And that's why this test is showing up the way it is. Um, so is it the, is it the IgG antibodies that open the tight junctions? Is that what does it? No, there, there's a specific protein um, that they found um, called zonulin that mm -hmm. causes the gap junctions to open. Basically when those gap junctions open, then the, the food protein gets into your blood and your immune system attacks it. If it thinks it's an invader, that creates the IgG complex. Interesting. Mm -hmm. and, you know, one thing I've been thinking about too with food is like the components and, and chemistry of food, because it's important to note that like, if you're eating a bagel and you're eating a bagel every day, everybody's like, well, it's the gluten, but a bagel is also made up of all kinds of other stuff, you know, uh, like bleach 
in some instances, you know, food coloring, all kinds of chemicals. And it may have even been like the fact that it was subjected to heat at some point that turned those chemicals into, um, into problematic factors for you. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. So that, that's real interesting. The elimination diet, um, I know a lot of people are doing, uh, for instance, like a, like a carnivore diet, for instance, and are seeing results with it. And I, you know, um, actually I hear Joe Rogan say this a lot and I don't go to Joe Rogan for my health advice, but he actually, he actually frames this in a very interesting way. He's like, well, maybe the carnivore diet is working for so many people because it actually is an elimination diet considering how many problems people have with things like grains and sugar and certain carbohydrates. Not that I'm a zealot against carbohydrates. It's just so happens that so many problematic foods are carbohydrates. My, that, my working theory has been that a, a lot of car, uh, people that get better on a carnivore diet, not just the elimination diet, but it's also low FODMAP. Mm -hmm. And so the most common gut condition that I treat is SIBO. And a low FODMAP diet is basically avoiding highly fermentable foods. Mm -hmm. If you're mostly eating meat, you're not eating those highly fermentable foods. And so you're treating the SIBO without really knowing it. Um, again, that's coming from somebody that that is really focused on the gut. But I, I actually really agree with that standpoint that, yeah, if you're going from a diet that's full of um, processed foods and all of this, and now you're just eating mostly meat, like, yeah, it's going to make sense that you're, you're going to feel better. Do you have any stance on things like um, histamine rich foods? Because, you know, I, I've, I haven't really dug into like how histamines work. Um, it seems very complex. And quite frankly, it seems like I'd have to give up a lot of the foods that I love uh, because I do think I eat a lot, high, a lot of high histamine foods. But um, a lot of high histamine foods are also considered health foods. So I'm wondering, you know, if this is a thing that you see a lot and how you address that. So, this, yeah, this is a really interesting topic to me because if you look at the low histamine diet, it looks very, very, very similar to the low FODMAP diet. And again, being a SIBO person, being a gut doctor, I, and I've, I've have friends that are nutritionists in the functional medicine world. And we've disagreed in the big, for a while, I was like the low histamine diet is just people with SIBO. Um, so when I have somebody that like, looks like they might have a histamine issue, I always like to test them for SIBO. And frequently I have seen patients get better when we get rid of the SIBO and then they could eat the high histamine or the low or the high FODMAP foods. That being said, I think it's been between three and five patients over the years. They had an issue with histamines. We also found SIBO. We treated it. They still couldn't tolerate the histamines. So it, I do think it's a thing. And I mean, there's, there's probably a genetic component to it. Um, it is what I've found is that, and then every person that that's, you know, got issues with histamine or FODMAPs um, usually has a, you know, it doesn't exactly follow what every FODMAP diet says, low FODMAP or every histamine, like every, all of us are a little bit different. So I think that that's an area that, um, in regular medicine that I, I try to differ is like, once they start you on something, they never want to get you off of it, right? It's just adding stuff, right? So, and with my patients, I'm, I always encourage them. I'm like, listen, let's try to, you know, introduce a high histamine food. Let's try to introduce FODMAPs. Let's see where you're at, because if we don't try, like, I don't want to keep you like, the, you know, on this diet forever if we don't have to. So let's try. I mean, I, it always has to be, the person has to be like mentally prepared, um, and also understand the risk that like, Hey, if, you know, if I have this food again, I might get symptoms again. So, um, I definitely think that there's people out there with a histamine issue. The best success that I've had is testing and treating them for SIBO. Um, and I think, and there is like a small subclass of people that just don't respond to anything but a low histamine diet. But it, it's a small percentage. It's very, very rare in my experience. Where do you think, um, 
like a SIBO or a histamine issue would come from. Do you think like you can narrow that down to like one or two things? Is it, is it, I don't know, trauma? Is it overeating? Is it, where, where do you see it coming from? Yeah. Um, I, the whole uh, spoiler alert, I'm going to reveal like the big secret I reveal in my book. Um, mental, emotional, spiritual health is the key to gut health. And, and we, we can talk all about the gut brain connection and why that is. But when you're stressed out, depressed, have trauma, whatever, you are sending signals down your vagus nerve into your gut that tells your gut to not digest, right? We have our sympathetic nervous system, our parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic is fight or flight. And the analogy I use now that I live in Montana is like, let's say you're hiking, you see a grizzly bear, your fight or flight sympathetic gets activated, you want to run away. At the end of the day, when you're sitting by the campfire, parasympathetic is activated, rest and digest. The majority of us are living in that sympathetic response all the time. We wake up, we go straight to our phone, we look at our email, we look at our texts, our calls, we turn on the news, and it's just a disaster. Then we have breakfast while we're moving around, while we're listening to the news. And we're just constantly telling our gut, hey, don't digest. So when that sympathetic is activated, you don't make stomach acid. If you don't make stomach acid, you don't digest your food, you don't kill off bacteria. That, in my experience, has been one of the biggest reasons why SIBO happens. Anything that kind of impairs digestion or slows down your GI tract. So even something like, so I don't know that I could pinpoint it to, if I had to pinpoint it to one or two things, I would say the one thing is for most of us, trauma as a child, which then shuts down our digestion, which then can present a SIBO five years down the road, 40 years down the road. That's not everybody's story. I've met people that one course of antibiotics and their gut is just bloated, um, uncomfortable pain, nausea, and literally SIBO just onsets right after the antibiotics. Um, SIBO is a overgrowth of bacteria in your small intestine. So there's also some people that have been having GI symptoms that get COVID and their doctor tells them to go on a Z pack and they feel better for those five days because that Z pack is addressing the SIBO, but the SIBO comes back with a vengeance and usually worse after that. Um, chronic constipation, diabetes, um, motility issues are all reasons why um, SIBO starts and, and meds. Um, but in most people, and like, you know, and this is, I mean, patients that come to me are, are expecting to get the perfect diet, get the right supplements. So when I start talking about mental, emotional, spiritual health, I get huge red flags, huge, like, Hey, don't go there. Just give me the right supplements and everything will be fine. The way, the reason I can relate is because I was in denial. So I, I can usually spot someone in denial pretty quickly when you've been there for a long part of your life. Um, and like my trauma, like if you looked at my life, it wouldn't, you wouldn't call it trauma. Like I, my, um, parents gave me everything growing up. I was, I had, I did well in school. I had friends, sports, like everything was okay. But me being a first generation American, I never felt like comfortable. Like I never felt secure. I was constantly trying to fit in, um, trying to figure out what would make me fit in. And I was just completely insecure most of my life. And I learned that through a lot of therapy, like that, that's why I drank. That's what made me comfortable. And that, that was trauma. And like it, it regular med school residency, Peter would have been, was like trauma. I don't have trauma, but it didn't matter. Like I didn't go to war. I didn't have something significant. Like I created the trauma. Um, so that to me are, are some of the, those are to me, some of the biggest reasons why something like SIBO can happen. Um, and it, it's, it's our environment, you know, it's, it's the meds, it's, it's our diets, um, it's the stress. And so a lot of people are at risk, right? 
Absolutely. And the, tr- the trauma piece is, it's such an interesting piece to me. Um, I read the book, uh, the body keeps the score recently. And I mean, that's just the most, I mean, the most vivid, uh, explanation of trauma, right? Um, this guy's stories as a doctor and the patients he saw, just the things. But then, you know, there's that other part too, where it's like trauma can come in all kinds of different sizes and shapes. And you actually have this real interesting line in the book. I think about it all the time now, which is a lot of people's disease comes from when they were young and all they wanted was the love of their parent who didn't give it to them. So what would they do? They would cry. And now as adults, they still do that, but it manifests as, you know, diabetes or, uh, you know, what name the gut issue or whatever it is. They just are manifesting disease. And not to say that people are doing this on purpose, it's actually most likely become an unconscious thing, but that's the classic person who's just always sick, always coughing, always going to the doctor. And it's a form of trauma. And it it started, like you said, because just like, not enough attention as a child. And the way that you learn to get attention is like, I'm not feeling well. And like in my, my, my office in Chicago is next door to my mom's office. So I always, I tell a lot of people, I'm like, usually it's our parents that screw us up. And so she gets super pissed when she hears me say that, but, um, cause they, 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 they are doing their best, but my, I mean, my parents were also just trying to survive in this country. Like they had nothing. Um, so, you know, for all of our parents are doing their best. I mean, we're all doing our best at, at the moment for where we're, what we're capable of. And it, yeah, it's very real. Like, and it, it's hard to accept, like for me, it was extremely hard to accept that this could have started when I was a kid, just from feeling insecure and, and, um, that it presented as something as significant as alcohol issues. And for, for people like for them to, um, accept that, like my SIBO could be due to like the toxic relationship I've had with my wife or husband or my parents or my job. And it, it's, it's, I get why people throw up like the red flag and, and, and it's, extremely difficult to address. It's painful. It's way easier to find the right diet supplements. Um, and what I've found over the years is also people that they're in mental, emotional, spiritual health is balanced. Healing the gut is really easy. SIBO, dysbiosis, candida, low stomach acid, all of that stuff goes away quickly. When there's that internal struggle and our brain is sending that signal down our vagus nerve to our gut. Your gut is that whole tube is lined with a nervous system called the enteric nervous system. Mm. It's 200 to 250 million neurons. It, it's more, there's more than like your brain. So when that nervous system is constantly being fed signals and you don't know it, and that's, that's the, probably the worst part about it is like, you don't know that what you're feeling as a kid is damaging your gut. And then that's going to present as autoimmune disease when you're in your twenties or something. Um, you don't like necessarily get the symptoms or you, you assume the symptoms are normal. Like, Oh yeah, I just, that's what I deal with is abdominal pain. Um, so it's, it's to me, the most important part of functional medicine is the most important part of health at the same time. It's the most difficult. The enteric nervous system, it's just mind blowing how that, how the mind body connection works. And and that's really why that's really like what's at the base of this channel and my blog and, and, you know, these interviews and everything I do, which is really connecting, you know, how to optimize the mind through the body. Because for me, my own personal health transformation was a gut rebalancing protocol. I basically did like a five day bone broth fast and used a bunch of like gut healing herbs and all this stuff. Um, and it was transformational, you know, cause at the time I was, I didn't realize it, but I was really depressed. You know, I had a lot of, uh, you know, mood issues. I was just real irritable, constantly stressed out. And it's not like it was a, like a complete transformation, like, oh, I healed my gut and now I'm back. But it was one of those things where it's like, I could physically feel it. I could physically feel like, oh man, like I don't feel that, that depression 
anymore. And I didn't take anything from my brain. All I did was heal the gut. And then that's when I started diving into all this. And when you start going down that rabbit hole of connecting the gut to the brain and you see 90% serotonin made in the gut, you know, 50% dopamine, 50% GABA, acetylcholine, all these important neurotransmitters that, you know, people in my space are going and buying supplements off of Amazon. Like, Hey, I'm going to take this CDP choline. I'm going to take this phenylparacetam. I'm going to take all this stuff. And it's going to, it's going straight to my brain. It's going to blow out my, my neurotransmitters. It's like, no dude, take a probiotic, you know, clean up your diet. Like these are the easiest, most effective ways to, to, to hit your brain for positivity. Yeah, I totally agree. And that kind of just reminds me that there's also, I mean, I've worked with so many patients that they come in and they're, they know they're in therapy, right? They know they have trauma. They, they're doing yoga. They're doing meditation. They're doing heart rate variability. They're exercising. And they're like, listen, I just can't get better. And, and there's definitely that component that like, if you do have a toxin issue, a hormonal imbalance, uh, a gut issue, then all those modalities aren't going to work as well because your body's inflamed. So a hundred, as much as I talk about mental, emotional, spiritual health, um, it is a hundred percent a two-way street. And sometimes that physical stuff can be way more of a factor. And then when you get that physical stuff, right, all that stuff that you're doing for the mental, emotional, spiritual part gets way better too. Like everything just works better. Yeah. It's the, the two way street is, is so important to, to understand too, because you can't start doing the right thing until you like convince yourself like, Oh, Hey, I got, I got to do the right thing. I just like the gut pathway because it like, you got to stack the odds in your favor, you know, like so many people are starting from it's hopeless. And as soon as you start to realize, well, like just make like a little change, just like a little change every, you know, day or every week, um, whether it be go for a walk, take your shirt off, get the sunshine, or whether it be like, Hey, evaluate your diet and find like where those toxic foods are and see if you can replace those. Um, try a probiotic, you know, try, try the slippery elm or something and see how you do with it. Um, try, uh, you know, like sauerkraut or some fermented food or try like a low FODMAP diet, try a food, try, elimination that whatever it is, it, just do stuff to get the ball rolling, but know that you don't have to be a slave to the, you know, the pharmaceutical industrial complex. Yeah. And, and unfortunately the, there's so many people that either don't know that or don't want to know that. Right. And for all, that's a, like a kind of a rule that I have at my practice actually is a lot of times we'll get a spouse or a child or a parent that's like, Hey, schedule a visit for my husband or my son. And we learned very quickly that we had a rule. We're like, okay, we can do that, but we need to talk to that person first because if they're not ready and you're just sending them here, nothing I do is going to be helpful. Like it, for a lot of people, it is a lot easier to just be like, okay, give me a pill. That's going to control my blood pressure. It's going to help my blood sugar come down. I can keep doing whatever I want to do. It doesn't change my life. What we're doing in functional medicine is not easy, right? I mean, th there's nothing more difficult in life than trying to change. And whether that's trying to change your diet, your thinking, um, change the trauma, you know, the way that you perceive the trauma you've been through, um, taking supplements, doing this different kind of testing, a lot of times socially too, I mean, you're changing your diet and then all of a sudden you don't fit in with the people that you used to hang out with and eat with. Um, you, you have to worry. Um, so there really is nothing more difficult than change. And, and it comes to us at different times. Like we're already at different times, right? Like, um, and I always try to meet patients with where they're at. Like, if I tell, if I'm, if I'm explaining to somebody an elimination diet and all the things that we're cutting out and I just see their face going white and they're like, it just lose, I'm just losing them. I'm like, if this is too much, like you can skip it. We can focus on something else. Let's try something easier. Maybe let's just cut out gluten or just pick one food or two. And, um, and three months from now, a year from now, you might be ready to do the whole thing, but trying to force something that, that someone's not ready for is it doesn't work. Absolutely. And for a lot of people, it, sometimes it really is just the gluten. Like they have a lot of problems and they have a lot of, you know, triggers, but like sometimes like it, I, I saw it when I lived in New York and you just walk up and down the street and 
bakery window, uh, you know, sandwich place window, food trucks. I mean, you don't realize just how much gluten is around you all the time and how much of it's being eaten by people. That's why it's so hard when people try to give it up. They're like, it, it, it's, a, it's a huge change to try to get it out of your life because it's everywhere. Um, it, I wish everybody was that easy that just cutting it out would fix everything. Um, that's, I mean, it, it's definitely happens, but I mean, usually there's, there's more going on, but, um, and it's kind of amazing too, that like, sometimes like all we need to do to get better is avoid something that we're doing to ourselves, right. Whether that's eating gluten or you need to go on a low FODMAP diet. Um, and it's like, or an elemental diet, which is a liquid diet. Um, and it's like, I'd always just kind of laugh about it in my head. I'm like, the way we're going to fix you is by like not eating for like a short period of time. And you know, it, it's just, it's, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. Uh, the, I guess I was going to wrap it up, but I, I wanted to ask you just, um, I just thought as after you said that, but like, what do you think of, of fasting and things like intermittent fasting and, and, and the things that people are doing now, especially I'm sure you see a lot of it in the functional medicine space. Yeah. So I was, I was pretty out on intermittent fasting for a while. And then what I learned, I think the, the most importantly is that people weren't doing it long enough. Right. And the majority of people that I would have tell to do fasting or came to me doing fasting was 16 hour fasts. And I just wasn't, I didn't ever really saw any real benefits from it. And most people that, that do it are um, doing it for weight loss, right? And they just weren't losing weight. So digging into that deeper, the whole point of fasting is gluconeogenesis, right? It's, it's using the sugars that are stored in your body to make energy when you're not putting in energy. That process doesn't really get going to like hour number 20. So what, what in reviewing it, what I've learned and what the best evidence I saw was 24 to 36 hours, two to three times a week. And so I do that now myself. So I do Mondays and Fridays, Sunday is dinner. And then I don't eat again until Monday at dinner. Um, I'm a very early person. So I'll have like a very early dinner because I'm just up for a while. It's easier to eat early. Um, I'm more, I'm not doing it for weight loss. I'm doing it for all the hormonal benefits, I'd say, um, brain benefits, hormonal benefits. Um, it's, it's a, another thing that I, when I heard about it, I was like, I don't want to do that. Like, I, I love to eat. I don't, I don't even want to try that. I'm not going to like it. And it's just like any other like meditation or a muscle, like the more you train it, the better it gets, the easier it gets. Um, but and that's another thing that it's just really hard for people to do. So I, you know, I really try to gauge someone's willingness and readiness to, to attempt that. Because if you just, if you're eating five times a day and then all of a sudden you go to eating, you know, trying to go a 24 hour fast, um, it, it's going to be really, really difficult. Um, in general, I think everybody should be doing 12 hours every day. Um, and then if you want to incorporate fasting, like I, I would recommend 24 to 36 hours, two to three times a week. That's yeah. I've come around on it. Sure. And that's, that's a very like practical um, way. I think, I, I think a lot of people have embraced like the 16, eight, uh, you know, that I've seen it, it, it's yeah. such an easy, I don't want to say easy, but it's like a, it's another practical way, you know, cause it's a good food. It's a good, like eating, um, like organizational way of exactly. like living your life. Yeah. It's structured. Structured. Yeah. Yeah. But I do like the, you know, if you say, Hey, like I really do want some of those fasting benefits and I agree like fasting for weight loss, it's, it's not a great idea, but fasting because you want like, I mean the, the mental benefits, the spiritual benefits, the hormonal benefits, just the blood sugar stabilizing benefits, you know, like I always look at weight loss, like as a side effect, you know, like do the good, do the right stuff. And then the weight loss will happen. Um, exactly. but trying to lose weight, it just seems like it, it's just always a, a dead end for a lot of people. Totally agree. Yeah. When people come to me for weight loss, I kind of warn them. I'm like, I'm not like a weight loss doctor. Like if you follow through, you're going to lose weight, but the, the focus, we're not doing this to like lose weight. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Well, Dr. Cause, I really uh, appreciate your time. I think you, uh, you have a great approach to, to medicine and, and are one of these, you know, important voices in the field of functional medicine. And I, I thank you for your time today. And I'm sure people listening and watching have gotten a lot out of this interview. Um, just to kind of wrap things up, if there's somewhere that you can send a listener or viewer to learn more about you, to get your book, um, maybe even to work with you, uh, what would you, where would you direct that person? So my website is doc-cause.com, doc-koz.com. That's the best way. Um, we, my email and my assistant's phone number on there, my assistant, her name's Jasmine. She answers all the calls. She helps people get scheduled. She's been doing this with me for a lot of years and is just fantastic. Um, so she can get people going there. They can email questions to me. Um, the, the email address is on the website. Um, I recently got back onto social media, um, doc underscore cause doc underscore cause on Instagram. And then on Facebook, I think it's just Dr. Cause or Peter Kozlowski MD, um, trying to be a little more active on there as well. Good stuff. And we'll link to all that. We're, when we publish this, we'll have show notes and we'll put all those links there and hopefully people take advantage and find you and uh, seek out your wisdom here in the great land of the internet. Uh, well, Dr. Kozlowski, thank you so much again. Viewers and listeners, check out all of Dr. Koz's links, check out his book. And for more on all things holistic nootropics, subscribe to the channel and check out holisticnootropics.com. Otherwise, we'll catch you on the next one. Peace. Thanks for listening. For more brain-boosting info, in-depth articles, and show notes, check out holisticnootropics.com.